Oh, I'm live. Hi. Hello, everybody. Last day of the conference. You guys are awesome. Actually, not the last day of the conference. If you're here for the Design Summit, um, then you've barely got started. Uh, but uh, welcome to the Open Infrastructure Summit, day three, afternoon, 320 session. I'm Lisa. And um, these are my brothers. I love them. I'll let them introduce themselves in a second. But um, I'll just start out by saying uh, this is a topic that we're all very passionate about. Some of you might have seen a version of this talk before. But uh, as problems change, day two problems change, people are, um, Kubernetes is getting more prevalent and uh, in enterprises especially. And so people are um, spending more time solving these hard problems. And these experts on stage have not only spent a lot of time solving the hard problems, but have spent a lot of time going around the world talking about how they did that. So um, I've assembled some of the best of the best here. Um, and we've all done this before. So apologies now if we get a little punch drunk here on stage at day three of the conference. Um, we all know each other a little too well now. So, uh, but we'll try to keep the inside jokes to a minimum and, um, and let you all in on all of the fun. So like I said, I'm Lisa. I run the user group in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, it, was, uh, it is meetup.com slash OpenStack and has been uh, the cloud native open infra user group for the last couple of years. It was the first OpenStack user group. Um, and now it's the largest uh, CNCF user group as well. So we've got almost 7,000 members. And everybody here has spoke at it at least once, um, which has been awesome. And so um, if you too have an an awesome topic and you want to come to the San Francisco Bay Area, I will find a stage for you and a platform um, to share your stories. So um, I see some other user group members and um, managers and ambassadors in the room, so thank you for coming and, um, and thank you for all you do in this community. Okay, uh, I have assembled a group of operators and end users and architects and community architects and developer advocates, and I know that's more than five people, but we all wear about five hats each. <laughs> So, um, so that's who we are. So Tony, quick introduction, we'll go down that way. Sure, hello everyone. Ooh, good Woo. mic, we're hot. All right, uh, my name is uh, Tony Campbell. I am with Red Hat. Uh, before Red Hat, I was with CoreOS. Um, before CoreOS, I was with Rackspace um, and was in the very early days of OpenStack, so it's always good to come home. Uh, currently for Red Hat, I'm a part of the service delivery team. Uh, we are a group of SREs that take care of all the managed services at Red Hat, uh, including our managed Kubernetes offering. Um, and specifically, my team is responsible for spreading the love about operators. So um, if we were playing a drinking game, every time I say operators, y'all just you know raise a hand or throw your head back. So, and, yeah. and that's not just people operators. Th this is true, yeah. <laughs> Those aren't the ones I'm talking about. Yes, yeah, so that's me. Good to be here with y'all. All right, I'm, I'm Robert Starmer. Uh, I run Cumulus Technologies. Uh, we're a consultancy, and we help people in that migration process getting uh, into cloud environments, looking at private, public, uh, you know, containerized, virtualized, et cetera. Look at all those different pieces. Um, and one of the things that, that we've found that, that really sort of changes the game for most people is not looking at this as a set of tools, but really as a process. How are you changing your processes to leverage this environment uh, is really, I think, the key. And so that's what we try to help people figure out as they're trying to make these transitions. I'm uh, Joseph Sandoval. I'm with the Adobe Advertising Cloud. And I run a team that is running the infrastructure platform. Uh, been around OpenStack now. It's been since about the Diablo release. And been in public clouds probably since like the late 2000s, getting involved and in understanding that the benefits that it could bring to the business. Really, the key thing coming as an operator is really helping accelerate like the, you know, the developer, like our ability to, to build, deploy, and to really accelerate application development is what really drove me into this community as well as like Kubernetes as well. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohammed. I'm the founder and CEO at VexHost. Um, at VexHost, we do public, private cloud um, and consulting solutions in OpenStack. Um, but mostly, I do a lot of community stuff. So I am the uh, technical committee chair at the moment and the project team lead for OpenStack Ansible. And some of the interesting things that I've been kind of noticing as more of our customers and users are using more Kubernetes is um, applying lessons learned from things operating OpenStack and translating those into Kubernetes because there's a lot of lessons that as longtime operators that you learn through that and you try to apply those as Kubernetes a, a growing new technology that might have not suffered from some of the things that OpenStack has already kind of learned and, and found solutions for. 
Okay, perfect. Um, and you see all of our Twitter handles up there, so we are willing to keep this conversation going well past this session, tweet at us. Also, I have opened my DMs, so if you have a question and you're too shy to step to the microphone and ask it, um, you, can, you can DM me directly, and I will um, do my best to get to it. Um, see, introverts, I see you. Yeah, I'm one of you, trust me. So um, we're gonna cover, uh, we're gonna focus mostly on production workloads on Kubernetes because I feel like w that's where I wanna take this conversation because that's the problems I'm seeing a lot of people struggle with. Um, and we'll also get to things like avoiding data gravity and kube sprawl and maybe the operator's framework maybe. Um, and addressing storage scale and um, performance for stateful applications and a lot of those hard problems that I know you're ready to start solving. Um, but we are also at the Open Infrastructure Summit, and there's been some big news this week. And so um, one of the things I would like to see here is um, how many operators are in the room? Okay, architects? Okay, that's interesting. Sometimes people keep their hand up for both of us. Operational um, architects? <laughs> uh, and developers? Or end users as well? Okay, okay. And everybody else is in management or sales or... Something else. Okay. Also, who's also tired? Oh yeah. <laughs> um, we don't get to be tired. Uh, not yet. Um, okay. So we, okay, that was a pretty even mix. So mm. I guess we can. We'll. I'll keep all the questions on for now. Um, Sixty-three slides later, you guys can leave. Um, so I'm kidding. This is our only slide. But uh, since we are at the Open Infrastructure Summit, I'm curious about how much production. Uh, how much OpenStack and Kubernetes you're seeing there? So how, many, how much deployment of Kubernetes you're seeing on OpenStack? And I guess since, Robert, you're kind of in the m most of the customer deployments on the panel, I'll ask you that question first. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I'm seeing a lot of Kubernetes in public cloud environments. Um, and so you could say that it's the same model as OpenStack on Kubernetes, because they're not deploying to bare metal even when that's available. Um, in terms of the few customers that I still have that are building their own private clouds that, that are working with OpenStack as a basis, their, their internal customers want to move to containerized applications. And the mantra right now is Kubernetes is the answer for that. So we're seeing a lot of people deploying Kubernetes and then trying to figure out how to get their developers to leverage those new tools as they come online. Um, so that's, to me, that's still the big problem. It's not so much about turning the technology on or picking the right way to turn it on. If you're going to deploy your own Kubernetes in-house, you want to do it on OpenStack. I don't think there's any question there. Um, and if there is, we can talk about why that's ridiculous. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's important to have all of the pieces there. It's important to be able to deal with the underlying infrastructure components, uh, networking, storage, et cetera, and be able to map that into the Kubernetes environment. I mean, Kubernetes abstracts it, that's great, and from a developer perspective, it's fantastic, but it still needs to run. It still needs to be a, a live, accessible system and, and be redundant. And so that's why I think the pieces still fit together very well. Okay. And Mohammed, in your public cloud environment, you are running Kubernetes, yeah? Yeah, so we uh, work uh, with the community in the project called Magnum, which allows to deploy uh, Kubernetes containers uh, or Kubernetes uh, clusters as other things as well. Um, and we've seen a lot of interest in leveraging it, and there's been a lot of improvements recently, uh, even doing things like allowing you to deploy specific versions, or um, and, and there's a lot of big users. Um, I was part of uh, a media event that uh, the foundation had invited uh, one of the previous PTLs of Magnum, and he was talking about the CERN usage of Magnum. Um, and you know, they have, I think, close to 200 clusters running on Kubernetes, and some of them up to 200 nodes. Um, so it's definitely a very solid platform. And the very nice thing is, I feel like um, OpenStack's been around for a while, and a lot of us maybe in the room already have an OpenStack environment in place. And so it already has very reliable storage infrastructure. It has reliable network plumbing. It has all that other things. So rather than kind of dropping all of that and saying, I'm going to build a brand new infrastructure just to handle that um, with all the work with the cloud provider, with the OpenStack cloud provider, and you can really just tap into all that existing infrastructure, and you minimize all your costs by not having to manage two storage clusters, two network infrastructures, more computes. You kind of just run it all together. Um, and also something interesting that's increasingly getting popular is um, as we kind of talk about more serverless and virtual kubelet and things like that, uh, Zoom recently, which is a project that allows you to uh, launch containers um, as kind of a native resource, like so instead of Docker run, you just do Zoom run and you just have a container running. And so that has been integrated with virtual kubelet 
um, which even more excitingly, Zune has Kata support as well. So you can have an environment where you have multi-tenant containers running, secured by VM security, and not even having a full control plane for your Kubernetes. The pods are all running inside Zune as serverless containers, which I think that's a totally exciting direction to go towards. OK, so Project Ironic made big news this week. Um, Ironic is one of those things that you can run, it, it's part of OpenStack, but you can run it you know, without any other OpenStack components if you want, and we actually are seeing that um, out there a lot. So how important do you think this project will be for um, going forward with containerized workloads? Well, I think you know, the great thing is, is like, I think as we noticed this week, that a lot of the options, you know, Ironic definitely is there, like, and it's, you know, it took some time to get there, but now that you can actually, you know, I'm a minimalist at heart when it comes to infrastructure. I like things modular. I only want to inherit what I need to inherit, and that's it, you know, and I know a lot of times we want to try to compete, and especially in the data center, like, sometimes there's that idea that I could feature match, like, what's happening in the public cloud, and you're not. So you've got to pick these things very wisely, and so it's great to see now that we're getting down to really minimal footprint infrastructures you know, that allow us to be able to just say, hey, maybe I don't need all of this stack and all I really want to run is containers. You, you can do it. And it's not just the only project. Like, you're seeing other adjacent things. I think me and Mohammed were talking a little bit about the other day about, you know, running OSA, you know, just with Ironic and just that, that idea. I'm like, wow, now we really have some choice and options. And then it allows, like, an operations team because that, that's the hardest thing is, like, how do you scale, you know, your infrastructure and then all of a sudden, if you're, if you're having to scale your teams, you start to lose some of that, that you know, that, what you're trying to sell to your, your leadership about why there's a the benefit of running private cloud. But I think we're in this really golden age where uh, I would say, unless you, unless you need all these other parts of it, I would look at like a running and just get that specific roles that you need, and then that's it. And you're in a good shape to run a very lean infrastructure. Yeah, I'm just going to tag on that just a little bit because um, as a site reliability engineer, we're really concerned about reliability and stuff working. And I always get a little nervous because the more things you, you stack on top of it because it's cool, the scarier that gets for guys like me who have to keep that thing up in the middle of the night, right? So we're always looking for the most simple and basic platform to kind of run these things. So I think when people are doing this on premise, I definitely see OpenStack as something that people are looking to. Um, but the vast majority of the people we're working with, there's a lot of work going on in the public cloud. And then it's even asking the question, should I be running my Kubernetes cluster myself, period? Or should it be managed? Well, and there's another piece to all of that, too, right? When you start thinking about the different layers. So you have a tool like Ironic that can get your bare metal systems up and running something, right? Which is fantastic, because you can decide now if you want to pick OpenStack, or you want to pick just a, a bare Docker environment, or OpenStack plus Zune, or OpenStack plus Kubernetes, or even just bare Kubernetes. It's not, you now suddenly have the option of choosing what is, is running on your infrastructure and what layers of management you have access to. If you already have a staff that knows how to run and manage an OpenStack environment, it's good to keep that team around and have them then add on the next layer. Do you need what Kubernetes provides from a container management solution? Great, deploy Kubernetes. Do you just need simple container management? There's still a lot of companies that are building Java apps and they just need to run the Java app. Do you want to then add the burden of running containers on that on top of that as well? Do you need it? Maybe you don't. And, and I think the, the flexibility that we have with all these tools you know, now reaching better maturity, you know, to the point. Ironic is now a much more mature product. You can run it standalone, which is fantastic. So now you can use that as a piece of building out that architecture and just selecting the tools that you really need to get to your end running point rather than, oh, well, I have to have all of this stuff in place because somebody asked for it, right? We can actually make smarter architectural choices. So um, you started out by talking about, you know, people process it just technology and the people part is the part that a lot of people struggle with. Like, who's going to support all this? So you're building all of this stuff. And so you don't choose an Amazon or Google or Azure, or even if you do, is it up to them to support it? Or do you have to bring in an army of consultants? Or how does this stuff actually get supported? I, I, I'm, I'm an army of consultants. So <laughs> I mean, yeah. Please bring me. <laughs> an army of one. Uh, no, I, I think uh, this really comes to, down to what team do you have in place? Um, you know, we wanted to talk about stories. And I helped a company start moving into a Kubernetes environment. They had decided that Kubernetes was, Kubernetes was their direction. 
Um, and, uh, you know, the problem was not Kubernetes. Getting that started was fairly straightforward. Um, they were using public cloud infrastructure. It was a small team, so they didn't want to have the overhead of an infrastructure team and a development team. But even still, they were trying to find the right layer to get their developers to leverage a containerization process and a containerization to deployment into production process. Right? So they had problems that had nothing to do with the underlying infrastructure layer and didn't actually have the resource to bring those sorts of additional resources on board full time to run their system. In a larger company where you have more options, you might actually find that it is still useful to have some teams just running a Kubernetes environment and, and having maybe IT support that, and others that still need virtualization as a, as a cornerstone to their application development that need OpenStack in, in place. And you can still mix and match if you have the teams to support those infrastructure components. And if you don't, you're just then you can come to me. I mean, that's that's definitely one of the one of the values that we provide. Um, and I definitely don't want to get up here and do a sales pitch. But you can get to any managed provider, and they can come and help you through that process. Or at least you can tap into the communities that they're a part of and learn how they run things. Um, because it's one thing to stand up a, a playground Kubernetes cluster, but it's another thing to run that cluster in production and to make sure it's servicing those workloads 24-7 and that you have your whole plan together for backup and for recovery and for upgrades and figuring all that out. Now, is now the time for me to jump in? Is it time to start? You if can start. If you focus on the problems you're solving, yes. what so, is the operator framework, Tony? One of the ways you can look to solve these problems is through um, the operator framework, github.com slash operator dash framework. So one of the things we're a big proponent of, proponent of is the operator framework when it comes to Kubernetes. Uh, so in Kubernetes, we all know that it's, um, it's a declarative framework and there's a control loop. You tell it what you want the world to look like and this control loop makes the world look like that, right? Um, and we're just carrying that pattern all the way down through Kubernetes. We say operators all the way down. Um, so when you write your software, we're writing it in such a way that we're using this operator framework to take our operator knowledge, how do I back up? How do I restore? How do I upgrade? We're taking that knowledge that a human operator would have to do, we're putting that into code, packaging that up into an operator, which is basically a controller, some CRDs uh, in Kubernetes, and we're deploying that in Kubernetes where the software is smart enough to be not only automatic, but at the, the highest levels to be autonomous, where it's doing all this stuff on its own. That's Who here has heard of the operator framework? Okay, see, there's going to be big announcements about this next week I, if I can scoop the red hat press. I was wondering how long we were going to hear operators come from Tony. I knew it was coming. If you should have heard our talk on Monday from my team, we talked about it. That was we at least 15 it. drinks, by the way, if you're keeping track. Um, but it's actually quite a good community. We're, we're, we're joining it as Portworks. We're, we're joining the operator woo -woo. framework. Right? Yeah, so get on board. It's actually it's actually a really cool community. But, but Lisa, I was going to say one thing. So the, the one thing, I, in my team, they spoke on Monday, and it was, it was also refreshing for me because, you know, we run a very lean team. You know, you've been familiar with my team. And, you know, the, the one challenge that, you know, we have is, you know, it's great. OpenStack has gone to a place where, you know, things are very stable and it's great to adopt. And now here we are all of a sudden, like we're racing with containers and Kubernetes. And, and now we're starting to see new, new things emerge as challenges. Like, like for us, I think we talked a little bit about Cube Sprawl and some of the environments. And, you know, some of us have these compliance requirements where it's saying, well, you know, it, it'd be great if it was just like, you know, dev and maybe a stage in production. But sometimes you're starting to get even more than that. And then you start running into challenges of like, how do you start managing all these Kubernetes environments? You start running into config challenges. And the other piece is just, you know, you, you gotta have empathy for these operators because the job complexity is getting very difficult. You know, you're trying to maintain things. And I find that some of the areas that actually are challenging is outside of Kubernetes because, you know, you know, I work for an enterprise. I gotta meet certain compliance and security things. And that's where I think you're gonna start running into, hey, can I scale this team or not? It gets, it gets very difficult. I know there's a lot of work to try to address some of these areas. And you know, you're seeing a lot of different tools emerge to try to solve this problem, but I feel like we're kind of racing down that rabbit hole of complexity as we embrace some of this. So you have to really think about, you know, do I just need containers as a service and can I keep it simple? Or do I need the full benefits of like, what Kubernetes offers? Yeah, because there's definitely gonna be some challenges in how you scale it. So this is really interesting, and I, I really want you to spend another minute on this, because I know there's other enterprises here who are going to fall into the same trap. Um, what is Kube Sprawl, and how does it happen, and how does an enterprise avoid it? <laughs> I mean, there's, yeah, that's that one minute, that's a long. I, but I, I'll just say the short of it, you know, like we, you know, like the talk we gave, we talked about like our seven data centers. Well, guess what? For every seven data centers, we have multiple Kube clusters. 
And so, and, and then we get no shortage of requests to do more than that. And we're like, no, we are not going to do that. It's like, give me a really good use case of why. And the great thing is we're only building for our business unit. So we don't have multi-tenancy challenges internally. So we can kind of get away with saying, no, these are the environments we only need. And Kubernetes, you know, it's, it's a leaky abstraction. So, you know, all the way down. Yes, we got caught in containers and it's great. But you got to think about all these things all the way up to get security. So then you have to think about maybe I should look at a core OS or some other, you know, pieces that are going to give me this. So I think Kubesprawl to me, it, it starts with just like the clustered environments, but then it's also like what requirements am I, does my business ask of me? And that's when things start to get complex. Okay, go ahead, Mohamed. I was gonna just add a little bit to that. Um, so I was thinking of how we could eliminate that entirely. And I was also kind of thinking um, progressively over time, I think uh, like Netflix kind of started this trend of like immutable VMs and they built all this infrastructure around it. And then people were like, well, why are we doing this with VMs? Why don't we just make immutable containers? And we kind of got containers. And one of the things that I've been trying to talk about is moving towards like immutable Kubernetes clusters. We have a lot of tooling right now to get you a cluster. There's like a million of them at the moment. And one of the things that I'm thinking is rather than having in your pipeline a long living cluster that you always just deploy to rather than your deployment pipeline treats these clusters as one time short lived clusters and that way you don't have to worry about configs being weird you don't have to worry about you know some bob at 3 a.m. got woken up and changed the setting to fix it and on the next deploy or the next time they launched a cluster everything kind of broke down and so i think trying to push on the idea of launching a cluster per deploy because that doesn't take very long and gets you a clean state every single time and there's been enough kind of work to be able to restore that stateful workload from one cluster to another if you have a stateful set. Um, and then that kind of simplifies a lot of the operational stuff because if something's wrong, just launch another cluster and redeploy on it. And for the most part, that will probably solve your issue. So that's just an idea that I've been kind of thinking about. Well, and it, it actually helps uh, solve some other problems I'm seeing. So I'm working with a company right now that has uh, a half dozen business units that each have their own application environments, their own systems environments, and um, they're in the banking sector, so they actually have security requirements as well. They're trying to separate each of these domains. But they only want to run one or maybe two Kubernetes clusters per business unit just to try to limit the number of systems that they have to manage. At, at the same time, that then adds a whole bunch of additional complexity in terms of um, uh, you know, access controls, like trying to add in policy agents and, and additional tooling on top of Kubernetes to allow specific users to have access to specific components of the system. On top of the internal service-to-service -service communication, where you then say, well, even if you're not building a microservice type ac application, you're still going to need a service mesh because you need a way to separate internal communication beyond what just the, the networking interfaces allow you to do. So being able to say something like, you know, think of the Kubernetes cluster as one of your components of the application. You build operators to run the application inside, and you have the, way, the ability with tools like Magnum to deploy Kubernetes anytime you need one, right? It's just a piece of the application rather than a piece of the infrastructure in a way, yep. right? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, <laughs> and I'd love to believe that. And I think a lot of us have cultural challenges where, like, you know, they'll hang on to those clusters like pets. And here we talk about this. I'm just saying, in the, I'm out there talking to other operators. We try to go talk to devs, like, hey, we're going to blow this cluster up every time. And they are like, no, you're going you're gonna to do an in-place upgrade. And we have to battle. And we're trying to build, you know, our CI, CD, you know, we're trying to, like, build into it so that we can have that. But, man, I, I just don't know. That, I'm not a cloud provider like you, so I, I wish I was in your world. This gets to what Robert talks about a lot too, though, like changing the culture and getting people comfortable with this kind of this new world. Because we're totally on the immutable bandwagon too, where like it's, it's all about that thing may not be there, so your application needs to be able to survive. And getting developers, I consider myself a developer too, getting us to understand that um, and kind of live with that, it's, it's a challenge. But it's definitely once you, once you cross that threshold, it can make life so much easier for you. And the other thing we're doing a lot is we're, we're really into the GitOps thing. So like all of our infrastructure, um, it is declarative. We're storing it in GitHub. And we can spin up new clusters based upon the state that's in GitHub. We have tracking. Uh, we know what's happened, who's touched things. So that's been a real big help for us as well. OK, so since I promised we're going to focus on production workloads, and our title is Taking the Scary Out of Production Workloads, um, I want to hear some more we're scary stories. We're making it stories. scarier? <laughs> I want to hear some more scary stories. What, um, so Robert, what's the hardest uh, problem that you're helping your clients overcome 
and how did you do it? Well, I think the hardest problem is, is access control. It's how do I allow the right set of users into these environments, whether it's at the virtual machine level um, or at a higher, higher order level. There's still a lot of people that, you know, they have the, the, the pet mentality for anything that they deploy. And, uh, you know, classically, the very first time you show somebody how to deploy a, a virtual machine into the cloud, it, you know, if, if you do it the way I do it, I tell them, I don't tell them about security keys and they start trying to figure out what the password is for their virtual machine, right? Now try to get them to turn that virtual machine off because they can't get into it. They're done. It's toast, right? And they still want to go in and say, well, no, we can reboot into, this, you know, root user and change the password. It's like, no, that you have to change your mentality. You have to think about it differently. And, you know, with Kubernetes, same problem. Now you need to start thinking about roles. You need to start thinking about security. There's a whole new language, but it's the same set of problems just now at a containerized level. Oh, and it's somewhat harder to debug <laughs> what you're doing. So sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad, right? It's easier to deploy into production and scale your production, but it's somewhat harder to debug that in production. And people are still thinking of Kubernetes as the thing that they deploy that answers all questions. Right, so we have to avoid that particular thought process. We really have to make sure everybody's educated as to what Kubernetes can do for us and where the value is versus an open stack versus just the bare metal resources potentially. Right? And, and then how do we develop in that? That's, that's really the key. So I want to um, I want to ask one more question for now, and then open it up uh, to y'all if you want to have questions. But um, one of my favorite projects, Kata Container. I wore my Kata Containers socks today. Um, so most of you will remember. I know, right? It was very apropos. I didn't pack enough socks for my two-day trip. Um, so thank you, Kata. Um, uh oh. Can. Okay, I'll get that in a second. Anyway, um, back to Kata. <laughs> so you probably remember uh, Kata was released um, at the or announced at the KubeCon in Austin. So that was about three KubeCons ago, and then um, I believe first uh, production release of it was about last July. I think I ran the first ever Kata Container Meetup, July 10th. Uh, we did a hands-on training. Um, I love this project, but um, you're using it, yeah, Mohammed? Yeah. Okay, why don't you talk a little bit about Kata and how it fits into this whole ecosystem. Great. So just briefly to get everyone up to speed, Kata Container is a project that um, pretty much uses uh, virtualization in order to run containers inside of it. So instead of you, when you do Docker run, it, rather than just you know using the inherent built-in C groups and all the other stuff, it actually will run your workload inside of a virtual machine. Um, but then kind of there's a bit like improvements for specific to Kubernetes. So, you know, your pods have all of their containers running in a single year virtual machine to kind of optimize things even more. Um, and it had recently had added even support for AWS Firecracker that were recently released. So um, it's a really interesting project. And actually, when you were asking about the scary stories, I was like, this is kind of one of the things that helps a lot because uh, multi-tenancy is an issue. I mean, coming from a public cloud point of view, um, obviously, the only reason why we're launching a cluster for every customer that it's on demand is because you know, inherently, Kubernetes is like not very multi-tenant native, and um, even in like an enterprise environment, just because you know you're a single tenant doesn't mean you can trust all the applications that are running. There's an application that could be be doing um, a bad thing, and so we actually have been working to try and integrate. Um, uh, Kata containers into Magnum so that you can just deploy a cluster and using the runtime classes just specify and say, I want to get this, uh, you know, set of applications or this deployment to be using Kata containers because I trust this workload uh, or I don't trust this workload, most uh, preferably. Um, but it, it, again, there's other challenges that it comes because it does come with some certain limitations and, for example, you know, you have to be in an environment where nested virtualization is, is available or bare metal and that might kind of limit the choices of where you can uh, run that. But I think it's a great solution for um, folks that you know want to go to container path, but feel like the separation of containers is not secure enough. Um, whereas you know, you're, you're, you're getting the advantage of containers, but you feel that safety inside of you of like, I am using virtual machine constructs to secure my workloads. And I mean, if you don't trust virtual machines, then that's like a whole nother discussion to get into. <laughs> well, that's when you use ironic and just deploy bare metal. <laughs> Any other Kata stories, Kata experience? Anyone running Kata out there? Oh, wow. We got some Kata training to do. Let's get it out there. It's a cool project. OK. All right. Any questions from the audience? Can you, it's being recorded, so if you don't mind stepping to the mic so that everybody around the world and on the internet until the end of time will hear your question. It's a good thing I'm too tired to care. <laughs> um, 
I know I could look this up, but it's a common question. Uh, Kata containers, how well is it supported by Magnum these days? Um, so actually, I've been trying to work on a patch to pretty much um, natively install it. So like in Magnum, you can actually have this concept of labels. So you can just add a label and say like Kata support enabled or disabled or whatever. Um, but that has not been kind of fully completed. However, um, you have the ability to like manually do a deploy. So if you use the Kata deploy project, which is a bunch of like uh, Kubernetes manifests that will like pull down a, like a daemon set and all this other stuff to prepare you to be able to use Kata containers, that kind of works kind of pretty much out of the box. Um, so it works um, right now, but it's not necessarily like it's a one-click integrated button and we're trying to get to the point of uh, just enable Kata launch cluster. Uh, point of view. And you probably could look it up, but that would mean that all documentation is 100% accurate all the time, right? So it's good to ask the experts. So please, next question. Um, first of all, thank you for the, the great info and discussion on, on these topics. They're really helpful for, for me personally, I know. Um, one of the questions that, that uh, came up earlier was uh, touching on cube sprawl, right? Do you guys have a, um, a mechanism or project that you use or could refer to um, uh, preview um, updates and deployments to existing clusters, so you can kind of see what what the state's going to look like after this deployment versus before. Kind of like a validation on an upgrade or something like that. Like a dry run. Like here's what it it's going to do if I run this, or what it would look like. Yeah, I'd kind of like to more like to see a diff of the you know of the state before and after. So. I know, hey, you know, we're gonna, this is actually gonna scale back, you know, the, all the applications that are currently scaled up um, when we redeploy Helm, because, you know, maybe you forgot to, to pull the replica label out of your field out of your, your um, deployment description. I think the closest to that, especially if you're using something like Helm, is you can dump the manifest from Helm, both the running state manifests and the manifest that would get created by the, the, uh, the Helm chart itself. Uh, and you can do a diff there. And that's going to give you the closest differential of, well, these are the different versions of IDs of images and, like you said, replica uh, variants, scale numbers, et cetera. But I haven't seen a specific tool that, that looks at that. Maybe not at the cluster level? Especially not at the cluster level. I'm just thinking even just the individual application level. Right? Okay. And I guess you're driving at the, it's the fear of the upgrade. What is this thing going to do when I actually upgrade it? Is that what you're kind of guarding against? Yes, I mean, we, we run, we have a cube sprawl problem, right? And we're also kind of resource constrained. So um, we have a tough time, you know, replicating our metal deployments on extra metal that we don't have, right? So we've tried doing, you know, virtualizing this on top of OpenStack and um, it works for the most part, but there's, you know, deploying on top of VMs is not the same as deploying on metal, right? So oh. there's stuff that we've gotten bitten by. So we're trying to, to figure out if there's some sanity checking that we can do to, try to mitigate some of the, the, um, the gotchas, right, that we would otherwise miss. Yeah, a pattern, I don't, I don't know if this can help you, it's not a project, but a pattern that, that we use is um, within OpenShift, we're building in this upgrade functionality where it's basically push button upgrades, but underneath the covers, that's all operators. So the operator knows how to do the upgrade and take from version A to version B, and then you can test, test that like crazy like in, in a side environment before you run it, and then knows how to roll back and, and canaries and all that good stuff. But we use the operator framework to kind of help us build that out. The, the, the other thing that you could consider is, uh, you know, as, as uh, we were talking earlier about um, uh, the, the GitOps kind of workflows, yeah. right? So if you check in your production manifest in the Git, then you can look at the, the diffs within Git. So you can use Git as a tool, as a gate, um, and you can even, you know, look at, at uh, some of the continuous delivery tools as a, as a gating mechanism. Um, even some of the Git tools have gates effectively in them. So yeah, you committed something, uh, you know, only when you push it to master do you actually say, yes, this is the, the live state, right? And, and that way you can actually validate something in advance. You can push it to master. That's what gets pushed into your cluster. And there you have the diff and you have then the live running state and you can always compare them, right? 
Um, also, I think that also that is a solution that can be solved by process and maybe not as much by a tool. Um, so for example, I encourage companies a lot to run a basic CI platform and maybe very uh, biased towards Zool. But so for example, you know, you would push up a pull request for to make a change, and in that pull request you deploy an entire Magnum or you know Kubernetes cluster in any way you want and run that change against it, and then you know to have some basic smoke tests to make sure that the things are asserted to the right place, and then you only only that merges after it passes all the checks. Now, that's not gonna just like solve all your problems from day one, but it introduces a framework that the next time something deploys and you realize this thing broke, let's go back and add a test to make sure that the next time we merge this thing, it doesn't break. And over time, you'll end up with a long list of things that are kind of getting pre-validated on every single time so that you kind of never do the same mistake twice in a more automated fashion. But I wouldn't say that's an ideal, just like all, you know, solve everything right off the bat, but it'll just, put in a process to avoid that ever happening again. Well, and, and to, to second that, you know, a lot of this is, I, I said it at the very beginning, we often think of tools. Here's a tool and it's gonna solve all of our problems, right? And in terms of a tool that could maybe help, maybe something like Airship, which is designed to deal with multiple clusters, but it's a major tool, that's a major commitment to investigate that kind of a technology. Right? If you can instead look at the process, even for a very small team, which is what, you and one other maybe? I don't know, right? It, it, you know, even for a really small team, if you, if you have a model for how you get from A to B, even if it's, yeah, we need to dump the manifests or we need to use, maybe develop an operator to help us see what's going on in our, in our system, uh, you know, you, you end up building a new process, a new model, so that when you bring another person onto the team or, you know, hand it off to a different team or whatever, you know, there's a consistent way of continuing to do that. You don't have to keep redeveloping the model for how you incorporate something rather than just understanding a specific tool. Right. Okay, and by the way, like I said, here's our Twitter, and we can keep all of these conversations going. I want to make sure if somebody else has a question, we have a chance to get at least one more question in. Um, my question's about cost models, cost calculators. One of the battles I'm having is like, Kubernetes is too expensive. Okay, figure it out, you know, and we get into the thing of, well, the developer wants to buy four bottles of soda, but we can only get the case. You know, then you go, well, that's too much over. <laughs> and then you have to go find someone that sells, you know, bottles, but they're, you know, a different size, and that's too big too. And it, is there any kind of common ca cost calculators across all these cloud um, solutions that, you know, without building a custom spreadsheet for each vendor, uh, has anyone run into that, that kind of thing? Because that's my bedtime story is meeting the accountant. <laughs> <laughs> it's your nightmare. I, uh, so this is really interesting. I had a conversation with someone about this uh, a few days ago, and it was kind of funny. I was like, people were always like, Kubernetes and running containers is actually the best thing ever for a public cloud provider because it gives them the big bucks. Because when you think about it, usually when we lived in the world of VMs, you would have a VM, you would launch it, put your workload, and when you're done, you could delete that. In a kind of more Kubernetes world, you can have a long living cluster and you're gonna be charged the whole time that cluster lives. And unless you start getting like involved in like auto scaling that cluster up and down and that adds a lot more complexity. Um, but I think the solution that people are moving to is kind of going like the what virtual kubelet is trying to go, and I think that all the kind of you know I'll just AWS and all these other services that are adding these um, like per second based container you know billing, and you link that with something that goes with um, like virtual kubelet. I think that's kind of the best way to make your accountant happy. Um, otherwise, I think the challenges, you've pretty much replicated the issue that we went to the cloud to avoid, which is like you've got servers that you're paying 24 seven all the time, even if they weren't fully utilized, and now you have a cluster that you're paying for most of the time, even if it's not fully utilized. That's my view on it, so I think, I think we're not at the best optimized solution, in my opinion. It will cost you a bit more, but I mean, you gotta think about the value that you're getting from having Kubernetes, so. I, I don't know that it necessarily costs more. It really comes down to what is the cost of your application? Yeah. What does it cost to run and operate your application? And if a tool like Kubernetes reduces your operational cost, that's where you get the benefits. Yes, and unfortunately, I don't think there's a single tool that can give you that number across a number of cloud providers. You almost have to build that yourself because you know what your operational costs are and the complexity of operating your application is. 
and regionally the cost of the people part of that is going to vary greatly. Yeah. One thing I've seen is I've seen uh, developer shaming. So if a developer's spending a lot of money, make that public. Like if you're tracking that. We do that. Like show the world. So like everybody knows, because it's easy to spin up resources and leave them sitting out there if nobody's looking. And then also as a part, I feel like I'm always plugging the operator framework. It's open source operator framework. There's a metering project on there where you can do telemetry and you can use that for chargeback and stuff like that. So that could be helpful to, to see what people are using. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's tough because I, I, I actually had the same thing come up recently and I was talking to the foundation members about like, hey, guess what, I'm doing another cost analysis and we want to keep showing why we're doing what we're doing. And it just feels like there's this ongoing thing. And so, you know, I'd love to say, yeah, there's like a clear tool for it. And, I'm, and my, my advice to them was like, it'd be great if there could be a focus so that sometimes we're going to always sometimes be in that battle of like proving out these costs and like, you know, are we in the right space? You know, should we be in the data center business or not? Maybe we should go back to public cloud, you know, but yeah, I'd love to see something more come out that a lot of us could leverage. So I, that was my ask to them when I was like, I'd really appreciate some help here because it gets tiring every three to five years having to go back and prove out why we're doing what we're doing. Okay, I think we have come pretty much to the end of our time. I'm Lisa, that's Tony, Robert, Joseph, and Mohammed. You can come and ask us anything. Ask Tony about Operator Summit. Ask me about stateful applications, because that's my day two nightmare that I'm helping people solve. Um, and you, I think you know what our expertise is now, um, so we're happy to hang around and answer some questions. Otherwise, thank you for being troopers and coming to the almost last session of the almost end of the conference. Really appreciate it. Give yourselves a hand. Hanging in there. Thank you.